So welcome tonight. As I was saying before, the, our translator Samdup Sering is away in India and so um, this week and next week will be a little bit different to normal. So um, thanks for coming. And the, the general topic uh, in the newsletter for these three, these next few weeks, um, so these two nights that I'm doing, then Geshe Losang and then uh, Geshe Doga teaching is under a general umbrella of heart advice. So not that I have any particular heart advice to give you, but um, sort of in the years that I have been um, listening to teachings by Geshe Doga and other great lamas, um, there are many things that I've heard that, that I have tried to um, develop in my own practice and my own approach to life. And so I'd like to sort of run through a few of those, some points that I think are, are very important for us to, to understand and incorporate. And then, you know, all these various points to somehow try to produce a, uh, a collective approach to life through all these different ideas. So the starting point uh, is something that always impressed me when I would hear His Holiness the Dalai Lama teach and he would often start with this uh, sort of statement that you know I, I wish for happiness and I, I wish to be free from suffering. And so as a human being that this, this is some uh, like innate uh, wish that we have. We have this very deep seated wish for happiness and a wish to be free from suffering. And so uh, every action in our life can be viewed from that, from that point that everything that I have done is motivated out of my wish for happiness and my wish to be free from suffering. So this is, you know, the first times I heard it, I thought, well, that's a very self-evident. It's a very self-evident point. What's the particular point of stating this when it is such a self-evident point? And even to the point where it, to us it may even seem trivial, but I have come to believe that this is a very important uh, affirmation to make to yourself. And it then becomes a basis on which we can understand everything that we have done in life. And also we can see from, from this basis how I do not have happiness. You know, the, I do not have happiness, I do not have the freedom from suffering, even though I want happiness and I want the freedom from suffering. So, so analysing or looking at this very self-evident fact can help us understand why we do not actually have happiness and why we do not actually be uh, free of suffering. So, and I think that... Uh, the other points that I'll mention tonight and, and next week, they can be viewed in collaboration with this sort of very self-evident truth. And, and I think there's a, you know, something that, that I feel has benefited me is the, is the enabling of a holistic picture of how everything can fit into that uh, my own personal wish for happiness and my own personal wish to be free from suffering. So the element that flows from that is that uh, not only do I have that wish or those two wishes but it is actually my own self-responsibility to fulfill those two wishes. You know, there is, the Buddha himself said, you know, you are your own protector. Who else can be your protector? 
trying to make this point that that no matter what help we may seek or, or what we might think others should do for us or what we think the Buddha should do for us or whatever, whatever we think like that, that the bottom line is that I am totally self-responsible for my own happiness and my own freedom from suffering. And so this is another key point, is that you know, this sense of self-responsibility and then from that we uh, try to develop our courage to, to actually look at and see what is needed to be done. So, so this first, you know, in, in terms of what I think is heart advice, this, this very first point is that I, am, as a person, so as a person, that it is you know, the very nature of my person is to want happiness and to want to be free from suffering. Okay, that's, and that's not a trivial statement. And then the immediate flow on from that is that it's actually my responsibility to enable that happiness and to enable that freedom from suffering. So then this sense of self-responsibility and then the courage that is needed become important uh, aspects in, a, in, you know, certainly in the Buddhist path, but I think in, in really whatever approach we take to life, no matter what the approach we take to life, that these, these characteristics are very important to develop. So... The, then we have to, so from there, the next, I think the next thing is to try to work out, you know, wh where do you go from that point? You know, like our own life experience, our own life experience is this whole mixture of good and bad difficulties, the, our internal state, our, the our external state, we have all these, we have these pleasures, we have these happinesses, we have these miseries, we have these difficulties. So, the, I think the next sort of hard advice to go into is trying to understand how the world works. How does the world work? How, does, how do I work in the world? How, you know, me, me the experiencer, like this is my life. I am experiencing my life. So how does that, how does that actually work? And I think in my in my twenties, I spent a lot of time, you know, at the um, at, with the support of the federal government, wandering the streets, and just thinking, just just trying to work out what was life about. And uh, I think that uh, that question, when we start to look at that question we can start to develop a sense of self-awareness. And so self-awareness then becomes a critical point to, to have self-awareness. And so self-awareness is just the uh, honest apprehension of what's going on in your experience. So. And this is, I think, is one of the, the real stepping stones that uh, we have to move from being a person who thinks that the world generates my experience. So we can, we can have the point of view that the, the world is generating my experience. So, we, so as a result, we say, Oh, such a beautiful day, I am so happy. And so we are attributing cause to the beautiful day. And so the consequence then is my happiness. And, um, you know, we similarly we say, you know, get out of my face, you're making me angry. So again, we are attributing an external, absolute external cause to my experience. So if we actually look at our, our life experience, and I think we, certainly for myself, I think it seems like our um, upbringing, our education, our whole life experience 
you know, maybe the whole society has this underlying belief that that's true, that, you know, our, our experiences are the mere byproduct of the circumstances that we encounter. And so my anger is due to you, the annoying person. My happiness is due to you. My, my jealousy is due to you. My, my um, exhaustion, my, my tiredness, my, my disappointment is due to you, some external thing. So, and, and even in the way we talk to each other, that appears to be an underlying truth. You know, there seems to be no question that that is the underlying truth of our society. So, I think here the, the transition to make is to, um, is to sort of try to understand the, the way that we experience things. And so the model, the model that I want to uh, talk about is that, um, uh, you know, there's, there's I, there's me. And I think we can say that me, me, is the knower. I am the knower. The, uh, the knower of my experience. And then there's my body and there's my mind. So... So then, then there we can say there's the world. We only interact with the world through the senses. So the, our interaction with the world is only through the senses. You know, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. And so the way that we experience the world is then through awareness. It is not direct. So we do not actually experience the world directly, but we experience it through awareness. And it's that awareness is dependent on the interaction between our senses and all of the external. And that means other people, situations, circumstances, the scenery, the food, everything is experienced through these and in Buddhist terminology, they're called the five doors, the five doors of experience. So I think there's actually a very important point here. So if we, I think if we understand this, in this model of interaction, we can see that I am experiencing the world through my awareness and that that is a distant experiencer. There is a distance, a gap, between my actual experience and the object that is experienced. And so when we realize that there's a gap, we can start to reduce the, uh, the idea that we are seeing the world exactly as it is, that we are seeing this, this other person exactly as they are. But there's, because there's a gap, between my awareness and the actual person, that in that gap comes exaggeration, imagination, fantasizing, misinterpretation, uh, incorrect perception, you know, invalid, invalid apprehension in that gap, because there is a gap because there is a gap, into that gap creeps our misinterpretation, our exaggerations, our, our incorrect apprehension of the world and of other people. And that's, I think that's a really important point. So if, you know, if, you, if you're talking to somebody and they say, oh, so-and-so is so destructive, so this, so that, or, and you yourself are thinking that, you know, such and such is my enemy, they're so awful, they're this and that. If you have the ability to sort of just step back that little bit and say, my awareness, my awareness of this is that this person is the enemy. 
My awareness of this is that this political situation, this environmental situation, this society situation, my awareness is that this is unsatisfactory. So that's not saying that it's incorrect, but I think it's a little bit to put ourselves on guard to be, become aware of the uh, habituation that we have towards exaggeration, misinterpretation, uh, incorrect apprehension. So I think then, you know, you can review your life, and I make this mistake many, many times, where I'll think that I saw so-and-so, I saw so-and-so down the street, and then somebody said, no, you didn't. That, they just look a little bit like them, but it's not them. But in my mental process, you know, I might be convinced, I might be convinced that I saw this person or that person, but it, to me it just becomes more evidence of this process of the gap between the, the actual object, then my sensory interaction with that, and then my awareness of that sensory input. And so then, in the end, I have this certainty, I have this certainty in my mind, and I take it that it's an absolute concrete certainty, but it's a failure of this process, because the process has got these gaps in it. And in those gaps, we make mistakes. So I think this is a very important thing, that if we can accept that our um, apprehension of the world, our apprehension of other people can be faulty. If we can accept that, then that thought alone becomes a liberating thought that can defuse our anger, it can defuse our jealousy, defuse our pride, our various other delusions that actually cause us harm. So I think trying to understand this, the way that we interact with the world, is very important. And so that then brings us to the, the point of understanding that in my experience, so in my experience, there is an external object. Let's say there is an external object, another person, a situation. And so I have some apprehension of that. But then there is also an internal factor. There is also an internal factor. So in any experience we have, there's an external factor and there's an internal factor. And because the way the mind works, the, the internal factor may completely mislead us in the way that we perceive an external object. And similarly, the, an internal, so the internal factor can uh, uh, improve my happiness or diminish my happiness. It can uh, uh, engage a suffering experience or it can overcome a suffering experience. And I think these, this is the, the beauty of the Buddha's teachings about thought transformation, is that, that the, the reality of our, the way that we perceive things is the basis on which we have the freedom to overcome any circumstance. Because of this, the difference between the internal factors and the, the external phenomena. Because the link between my experience and the external phenomena is not fixed. And I think this is one of the most important things to come to realize, is that your thinking process is not definite, it is not concrete, it is not uh, absolute. The connection between yourself and an outside and another object, another person, that that connection is not absolute. And I think this is really a key thing to try to understand. So this, this notion of self-awareness. So 
you know, I, the language that we can use is, you know, so what we normally experience is, here's my enemy, here's my enemy, and uh, absolutely I will have anger towards that enemy. In fact, in fact, it's mandatory. My enemy comes into the room and I am driven by the enemy to have anger. You know, we see that as a, as a definite connection. Here's my enemy, here's my anger. And that's because we, we don't have the self-awareness to sort of uh, see that here's this person, here's this person, uh, you know, technically, technically, all I see is colour and shape. You know, with my eyes, with my eyes, all that I see is six foot tall, blue, black, you know, colours, this, that, and shape. That's all I see. Nothing, there is nothing other than that colour and shape that comes to my eyes. Yet, I apprehend an enemy. You know, with a whole history, with a whole uh, collection of, of characteristics that I loathe. You know, I mentally I loathe every one of these characteristics. So what we have to do is to see the relationship between that, uh, the external object and then this internal contribution. So there's this internal contribution from me which is actually generating my anger. Right, so anger is just an example here. We can apply the same analysis to desire, to jealousy, to, to any of the delusions. And we can also apply the same analysis to love and compassion. To see the internal, the internal factor, the internal um, uh, characteristic or the internal cultivation of the factor that can generate love and compassion to another person. So when we talk about anger, to see that there is there's this external element, the person, with all of the associated knowledge and history and stuff, and and then there's the internal this internal contribution. So we can look at that process. We can look at the process of what actually happens. So we, the, we have the vision, the sight of the person, and we see the person, and then immediately within our mind, we separate the object into like or dislike. So that process, if we actually look at our life experience, and even, even in this very room, if you look at the carpet, the, the moment that you look at the carpet, something in your mind immediately reacts to like or dislike. So the only options we have are like, dislike, and neutral. But nearly everything that we look at, there is, there is some initial uh, reaction that occurs. So, you know, and this, this ties in with some of the very basic uh, descriptions of what a person is, you know, the five aggregates. So the, there's the form. The form is the carpet. Then comes feeling, like or dislike. And this process within us is, is automatic. It is so deeply ingrained. Then so there's a like or dislike, and then we start to concoct a, a story where we embellish, we embellish the faults, or we, we uh, exaggerate the faults about a person or even about the carpet, and we can start to, we can start to exaggerate or, and increase the, our dislike of, the, of that particular thing by a repetitive thinking, and then 
we start to generate anger, we start to generate some other resentment or some uh, you know, very strong thing. And then we may even draw that out to the level where it forces us to act. And so in the case of a person, we then abuse somebody or we glare at them or we, we even strike out and hit them or whatever we do or we rip up the carpet or we, whatever it is that we do. But we can, our emotion is built up to a level where we then act out of that emotion. But it stems from that initial uh, like and dislike based then on this exaggeration process that we engage in. So the working of the mind is a really important thing to, to, uh, to understand. And so for ourselves, what we find is that we go about our, our daily activities and then out of the blue, just all of a sudden out of the blue, suddenly you'll find yourself very angry or you'll find yourself very desirous, very jealous, very arrogant you know very you're, all of a sudden you'll be talking to somebody and for some reason you're demonstrating this shocking arrogance towards them you know or you're you're engaged in talking to somebody and sort of out of the blue you're belittling them or you're humiliating them and you, you think where did that come from why am i doing that so what's really needed then is is the ability to be aware of your own thinking, to become aware of the initial moments of your experience. So what happens to us in practice is that the, the, uh, our interactions with somebody else, the first five minutes, we actually have no uh, sort of apprehension of our own awareness. You know, we have no uh, ability to see our own um, uh, mental processes, what's going on, until sudden we, suddenly we find that we are yelling at them or screaming at them, and then you become aware that you've got this great anger towards them, but the whole build-up of that is invisible to us. And that's because we have not uh, developed this quality of you know, like self-awareness or mindfulness. So to, to have the ability to see what's happening in your mind, to see right at the beginning the uh, deterioration of your attitude towards somebody, right from the beginning, to be able to see that. So for us, you know, as ordinary people, we can't see that. We're not aware. We have no sort of sensitivity to that process in our mind. And that's why, that's why meditation is so important. Meditation is the tool that enables us to develop this quality of mindfulness. You know, that through meditation, we're able to generate that self-awareness. We're able to have the ability to identify within us that while I'm, while I'm talking to this person, I can see I have some resentment. I can see that I have a dislike. I can see that I am, that that resentment, that dislike is increasing. And I can see that that I am generating, you know, a you know a stronger and stronger dislike to the point that it's becoming anger, that it's becoming something that I want that I can't control, and that I am going to I'm going to start abusing this person. You know, that's a process. That's a process that is actually occurring in us with every negativity that we have. But for most of us, it's invisible. And it only becomes visible when we are at the end point where we're, all of a sudden we're in a fight or we're arguing or we're, we're doing something really um, unsatisfactory, unpleasing. 
So meditation is the key to be able to to develop that ability, and it's a it's a like a product. It's a product of the meditation that continues beyond the actual meditation itself. So our meditation session might only be five minutes or three minutes or something, but the more that we engage in that single pointed focus, the the more that it is actually enabling our self awareness. And that's, that's a very important thing to understand, is that the medit when we meditate, that our motivation for the meditation is to benefit ourselves beyond just that three minutes or five minutes. And that the meditation is a, an opportunity for us to uh, mm, overcome the negativities that we possess. It becomes the opportunity for us to to diminish a a, a negativity or a, an affliction, a delusion that we have. Okay, so then. So then the, the next point I'd like to talk about is that uh, so this model, you know, this model of the mind, the awareness, our senses, the world, a consequence of that model could be that we start to think that we are like independent. You know, we're independent of the whole world, that it just depends on my mind. It's, that it's only my mind that matters and that, you know, that it's just I am independent of the world. Okay, so that's, that's a very wrong conclusion to come to. And so, but you can see how that if, if you go down the path is where you think that it's just the mind, everything is just the mind. You know, it's only mental, it's only experience. You know, so you can, you can interpret this thing of the senses and you say, all right, so I am separate to the world and it's just my mind, that's the only thing that matters. So that, that becomes a, uh, maybe not a very healthy approach because we think that we are independent, totally independent. And so we need to, uh, you know, correct that viewpoint by looking at how we are actually interdependent to the world. So, uh, in again, in the sort of Buddhist presentations, we are very much, uh, you know, asked to look at the interdependence of ourselves to the world. And so, uh, one aspect of that, that that I want to talk about is that, um, you know, I want to be happy. I want to be free from suffering. So I could start to think that, oh, okay, so all that I have to do is just create this sort of fairy tale, fairy tale mind, you know, some sort of... Mm, totally self-contained fairy tale mind living in my own dream world and I will I will achieve happiness and I will achieve an end to my suffering because I have cut off every aspect of other people that disturb me okay so so uh, and I think you know this is a trap that we can fall into this sense of isolation or this sense of in independence. So one of, the, one of the things that I have taken as a really fantastic heart advice and uh, both His Holiness and Geshe Doga have covered this sort of particular presentation and that is to, to start to understand that um, you know other people's happiness is your happiness. You know, other people's suffering is your suffering. And that 
you know, although we might think, you know, we, we can develop a very insular, we can develop a very insular approach to life where we sort of think, look, you know, I'm happy to be tough with people. I'm happy to be tough with people and tell them the way that it is. And I've learnt that I can control my mind so I don't get emotional about it. And I, I sort of preserve my happiness because I, I don't involve myself personally. It's, you know, this isn't personal, it's just business. You know, this sort of mentality where somebody thinks that they can harm others and they can somehow remain immune from any consequences. So the, the more we understand the interdependence of, of our, between ourselves and others, then we can come to this, this point where we can start to see that the development of love and compassion is actually our greatest protector. So that our, the greatest protector that we can engage in is the development of love and compassion. And so to understand why that is, is, that, is to really understand what it is that disturbs my mind. So to fully understand how anger, for instance, uh, is destructive of my own happiness that anger is destructive of my own happiness, that pride, pride is destructive of my own happiness, that jealousy is destructive of my own happiness. So we need to dig into some of these things and, and really have that self-awareness in the moment of jealousy or in the moment of arrogant pride in that very moment and have an introspection that can see whether or not it's a happy state or a suffering state. So once we start to, to uh, comprehend, you know, I think with anger, we can do anger fairly easily. Anger is such a strong and destructive emotion that we can, we can see how anger, by its very nature, is destructive of my own happiness independent of the harm that it does to others. You know, there's no question that it harms others and it motivates me to harm others through speech or, or physical. But for myself, the experience of anger itself is a harmful experience to me. And so that's where we need to have this self-awareness that can turn, turn our uh, attention onto myself, onto my own experience, and see that it is actually destructive of my own happiness. Okay, so once we understand that, once we start to understand that, then we can understand how love, you know, love, and the definition of love is a mind, so it's mental, wishing, you know, some sort of wanting another person to be happy. So love is a mind wanting another person to be happy. And compassion is wanting another person to be free from suffering. So to then understand that if I have a mind wanting this person to be happy, then so long as I can maintain that state of mind, then I cannot generate anger. Because anger, by its nature, is wanting to harm another person. Okay. And so if I have in my mind a mind wanting that person to be happy, then it's impossible for the mind wanting the person to be happy and the mind wanting the person to be harmed to coexist. Those two minds are contradictory and they cannot exist simultaneously in my experience. I can have one or I can have the other, but I cannot have the two simultaneously. So, so long as I can maintain the attitude of wanting this person to be happy, then it is impossible for anger to arise. And similarly, 
if I want this person to be happy, then the thought of jealousy, so what jealousy is, jealousy is not liking the success that another person has, not wanting the other person to be successful, not wanting the other person to be beautiful, not wanting the other person to have the promotion, not wanting the other person to win the lottery or to, to look beautiful or whatever it is not wanting and being unhappy at that being unhappy that they are rich and beautiful successful or whatever it is being unhappy with their success that's jealousy and so wanting the person to be happy is you know it's it cannot lie in the same mind as not being happy with their success. The two, again, the two things cannot coexist because they're contradictory. And so similarly, if we go through compassion, you know, not wanting someone to suffer. So when we see somebody, uh, you know, and they have success, you know, we don't want them to have that success. We want them to suffer. We want them to lose. We want them to be humiliated. We want them to, to be parted. We want them to be parted from their beauty, from their wealth. You know, that sort of resentment that we have of others. We want them to be separated from their success, from their, from their fame or their glory or whatever it is. We, want, we sort of have this mind, the mind of jealousy is, has got a little bit of that element of wanting them to be separated from their success, from their, from their beauty, from their wealth. So the mind that wants them to not have suffering, you know, is contradictory to that. So in that sense then, love and compassion become the protector from me harming myself. So to really understand how anger, jealousy, pride, arrogance, miserliness actually harm yourself and then you can start to understand how the development of love and compassion is actually the protection for yourself against against those sufferings for yourself and that's why so so these, these things all, you can say, all of these things stem from that, you know, the simple statement, I want to be happy. I want to be happy and I want to be free from suffering. So, like for me, when I started to look into anger, what reason do I need to overcome anger? The only reason that you really need to overcome anger is, I want to be happy. There's no, there, you don't need any other reason than I want to be happy. I want to be free from suffering. Anger is a suffering state for me. The only reason you really need, not because God said so or because the Buddha said so or the Dalai Lama says so, but I don't want to suffer. I must overcome anger. You know, that, to make that connection within yourself self-motivated taking the self-responsibility having the courage to look at yourself and honestly see the delusions that you suffer from and then having the determination to overcome them you know i think this is these these are the things that i have heard from the the lamas that that i try to take as some heart advice So we'll um, we can we'll do some meditation. So we'll just do the breathing meditation, and um, so in this we the mechanics the mechanics of the breathing meditation are that we focus on the breath and. In particular, we try to focus on the awareness of the breath. 
you know, like the mental awareness, our experiential awareness of the breath. And we, we start by looking to see what is my mind doing. What, so the question that we ask is, where is my mind? What is, what is it that my mind is doing? You know, what's it thinking about? Is it outside? Is it yesterday, tomorrow? Some, somewhere else, thinking, thinking, fantasizing, sleeping. And then we, we bring that all of the mental energy within ourselves. Let all of the external thoughts just drop away. Keep, keep letting them drop away. Bringing yourself <coughs> almost to a state of no thought. And then you turn your attention onto the breathing just the natural breathing and hold that hold that 100 percent so that we are excluding all distractions we are excluding all of the delusions we're excluding all of the disturbances completely uh, eliminating any disturbance and even in the internal sense we are banishing any delusion, any disturbance in our mind and just focusing on the breath. So let's do this for a few minutes. So just gently, just bring your concentration back, but don't let it get too disturbed. So just reflect, reflect on the meditation. Look at what actually happened in your mind during the meditation. And then we'll repeat the meditation, the same meditation and enter it with a very strong determination that uh, in order to subdue my mental delusions, I, I really need to develop uh, 
meditative concentration and uh, develop then the mindfulness and alertness, you know, that, that self-awareness. I really need that. I need that skill. And so I, I, I need to do the meditation. So I have this sort of strong feeling about wanting to meditate and wanting to meditate well. And so let's just repeat the meditation in exactly the same way, but with a very strong determination to keep the focus on the breath, you know, 100% on the breath for the couple of minutes uh, of the meditation. Now you can relax your concentration. Okay, so has anybody got any questions or anything they'd like to comment on? Yeah, Elvira. I have a
So the question is about um, people who get angry at themselves. So I guess I would ask you, um, would you deny the innate wish to be happy and the innate wish to be free from suffering as a human condition? So in your own mind then, how do you reconcile the, um, you know, this sort of appearance of anger at yourself? Yeah. Yeah, so, so um, I think what you're talking about is when there's a mismatch between your uh, vision for yourself and then the reality of yourself, okay? That there's a mismatch occurring between what, what you think you should, have, uh, um, you should have achieved or what you should be achieving or where you should be, you know, which is a... Mm, it's maybe it's an aspiration, maybe it's a concoction, maybe something made up by a, a uh, an illusionist, you know. Uh, whether it's you know something you know like we all um, we all have aspirations to be something, uh, but then the reality is that 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 aspiration is not met, right? So the aspiration is not met, and so we we then experience a uh, you know a dissatisfaction, an unhappiness, and that unhappiness can be really uh, deep seated unhappiness at the mismatch between our aspirational view of ourselves and the reality. Okay, so that's a problem, and it's a. You know, I think it to some degree it's a sort of form of delusional thinking where the the image has taken over and surpasses reality so much that we suffer from that mismatch. So, um, you know, and and we all we all suffer like that. We suffer from we suffer from thinking that we. You know, maybe we're a much better person what we, than what we actually are. We suffer from thinking we're a lot smarter than what we actually are. We might think we're a lot sexier than what we actually are. There's a whole lot of things where we mislead ourselves. And so we then, when we discover the mismatch between our fantasy and the reality, we suffer because of that. And so that's why I think this, you know, uh, going back to this idea of self-awareness is to actually be in touch with the reality of your own being, to be in touch with the reality of your own being. And so I think a part of that is, is to say to yourself, I am an angry person at times. I am a proud, arrogant, self-righteous, miserly, mean person at times. Have no illusions about yourself. But from that, some real transformation can occur. And the same in, in the workplace or whatever, that if you sort of think that you should be the CEO or the, you should be, why don't people give me the respect that I deserve? You know, like, you know, if you're suffering from that delusion, that fantasy, so you've got, you've got two choices. You can develop the skills that are required to be put on a pedestal, to be respected, to be highly, highly valued, right? Or lose the fantasy, you know? So I think a, a, a good dose of honest appraisal of your own abilities can help you then develop in the direction that you want to go. But if you live in fantasy, 
You'll just, all you will do is you will bemoan that the people are not giving you the respect and the, the pay and the conditions and the status that you deserve because you've never actually apprehended whether you really have those qualities or not. Yeah, so having love for yourself is being honest, being pragmatic, being realistic, being truthful, not living in fantasy, you know. Any other questions? Yeah. When you say about uh, suffering and you talk about the emotions like uh, anger, jealousy, hatred, being mean to someone, all those sorts of things, you talk about how, there's a question after all this, you talk about how those things are inherently to hurt other people when you feel them. When you're feeling them, you're feeling towards someone and that that is a, an emotion to hurt someone. You're angry at that person because they did something to you. But I have confliction over the kind of way you say that as in like, when you have anger, you also have a passion. Like, why are you angry? Why does this person, event, emotion, action, behavior, why does it make you angry? And being able to validate that and understand why. Okay, I'm angry because this person did such and such, which hurt me, or saying, I am passionate about this thing, and then trying to destroy it, take it away, um, remove it from accessibility, makes me angry. And so, to me, in that sense, something that I am passionate about and want to change. The anger provides me with motivation, although it does not stay as anger because it then becomes a useful tool to propel me to keep going because I am passionate about this thing. But yeah, just from what you were saying, would that count? Or yeah, so look, good question, and there's a few different points in your thing there. So one of the things that I'm trying to uh, say tonight from this sort of heart advice point of view is a little bit uh, just looking internally. So making a connection, making a connection between I want to be happy and anger is a destructive uh, thing of my happiness, right? So making just that connection, okay. So and and what I've said before is that from that really innate wish to be happy, that that alone is enough reason to overcome anger, right? As a truth, that's a truth. Okay, what you're talking about there is the fire or the passion that, that you're saying how anger gives you to rectify a wrong or to, to fix some problem or your interaction with somebody. That, that what anger gives you is an energy, a fire, a passion to act. Okay, and so a lot of people think that that therefore makes anger a good thing. Okay, maybe they do, maybe they don't. But let's, let's imagine that some people think that therefore anger is justified to rectify wrongs, to fix the environment, to fix the government, to fix whatever, to defend yourself. Okay, so the question that, that I would pose to you, is that fire or that passion to rectify a wrong also feasible through love and compassion. In a way, isn't it love and compassion though? Because you love this thing. It is not about hurting someone within the actions you take. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. So let's say from 
uh, that we approach that analysis. So what you're doing is, is the right thing to do, is to analyse your emotion, analyse your emotion, to try to see the truth of your emotion. And the, uh, if we use the Buddhist definitions, you know, anger, anger is the wish to harm. Okay, so if we stick with those definitions, then in your own analysis of, that, of your emotion in that circumstance, and if you think it's not the wish to harm, then it's good to use a different word for it, whether it's passion or uh, decisive action or some other word to describe your emotion. But to be very clear about what is actually in your mind, is, I think is, let's say, the sort of heart advice that I try to adopt is to really understand what's in my mind. And if I engage in an argument for the good of the centre or the good of the country or the good of my workplace or the, the proper execution of a task or whatever, I need to have that introspection that can tell me doesn't matter about other people, but that introspection can tell me what is going on in my mind. And so the real key point that I'm, I'm saying here, it's not about what's right and wrong in the outside world. I'm not talking about that. You know, I'm not saying that, that, that a person who uses anger to try to knock down the Berlin Wall or something like that, I'm not saying that the action is wrong but I might be saying that the emotion they've used is wrong to execute that task. So I'd see that there's a difference, that the action does not justify the emotion that was used in carrying it out. So that's maybe a bit of a contradiction to what we sometimes think. We think the end justifies the means, that if anger is the means to knock down the Berlin Wall, then the anger is justified because the Berlin Wall got knocked down. That's a question, you know, that, that if we stop a war or we start a war or whatever to save billions of people, we do it out of anger, therefore the anger is justified because we saved a billion people. That, that's a connection that maybe we don't have to make, right? So there's a, in your question, there's a few things. Do you think it's possible to uh, uh, engage in a circumstance that is very difficult, but instead of using the fire and the passion of anger, you use the fire and the passion of love and compassion? That's, sorry, that's sort of what I meant in that way. Yeah. Well, I think even from the beginning, it can be, it could be love and compassion, even from the beginning. Anyway, that's something to examine. And but the thing is that within your own mind and within your own experience, you have to have that that awareness of exactly what am I thinking, exactly what am I thinking. You know, because we're quite happy to say, oh, "I'm just being wrathful because I really care." But in, in reality, we're just being angry. Anyway, I think, it, look, it's a good question. And um, yeah, so maybe we should uh, dedicate. Yeah. So thank you very much. We'll just do the dedication.